Earth is colonized by plants, and, um, and they basically constitute the very basics and the fundament for our civilization and, and for everything on living on the surface of our Earth. Now, um, you know, if we think back a couple of hundred million years, um, that actually looked very different, right? So if you think back before actually land plants came to be and colonized the surfaces, probably it kind of looked like Mars on the surface of our planet, right? And only plants and their roots basically led to weathering and, and to soil formation and, and to the landscape and the world we know nowadays and, 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 and that we need to basically get nutrition um, and, and sustain our civilization, our popula uh, pop, um, population. And you can actually see that that actually, actually is a very um, small fraction of the Earth's history. So, so that's not a given here. It's actually like a, a very small fraction of the time this planet has been around. And this is, you can attribute almost all of this to, to plants. So land plants and the innovations that they have developed to conquer the land. And, and one of the major innovations are the roots, right? And so the roots basically allow the plants, and of course you all know this, to, to grow through the soil, to forage the soil for water and, and, and different nutrients, and to basically sustain the activity of the shoot, which is photosynthesis, and, and to basically take carbon dioxide and make into matter, right? So the roots are actually at the, at the very fundament of our civilization. All right, so very important. Okay, so, so um, now I'm gonna take you through um, a little bit more on roots. So, so roots can grow very large, and, and they do so for, for many species, but they come in very different sizes, right? Different plant species have different root length, um, but, but um, the roots have one thing in common, usually you can't really see them readily. So if you see, look at these, these grasses here, uh, and, and these plants, you wouldn't imagine actually the size of the roots that they actually develop and they use to forage the soil, right? And so, so that's at the, at the same time, this impressiveness uh, um, and, and this, you know, um, and this is impressive because we cannot see them is the problem in studying this because it's, it's very hard to study roots. And people um, have taken, I mean, science has taken a long time to really um, seriously uh, being able to study roots. Right, um, right. So, so as I said, different species actually have uh, very different root properties. You might think that basically there is actually a, a specific relation of above ground mass and below ground mass. That's actually not the truth. Uh, the truth. Uh, so you can basically uh, can uh, basically calculate the height and depth ratio for different plant species, and you can see that's all over the place. So just because a small a plant is small, it doesn't mean it has a small root system. Or just because a, a plant is very big, it doesn't mean that there is like a tremendous um, huge root system. Um, and that is also also something that's uh, still like emerging more and more. The more studies are, are basically being conducted, the more we understand about this. Um, and something that is actually not really well understood: how actually root systems of the same plant affect productivity. You might think it's kind of like a Zero, like a zero sum game. When you put more, uh, you know, energy into the root mass, you're going to lose, like, you're going to use yield or biomass above ground. That's actually not a given, because if you put more energy into the roots, you can actually forage the soil better. So it's it's a, it's a big question of how much, uh, you know, what what actually um, whether it's possible to get more root mass while ma maintaining the the yield of plants. All right. Then there are different uh, plant uh, groups, right, in terms of their ecology. So you have like large plants like trees and shrubs, and you have perennials and annuals. Um, and you can see that they actually, um, and, and here's the rooting depth from a big ecology study uh, basically plotted here. And you can see that trees, uh, not surprisingly, actually have the deepest roots if you compare them to the other groups. And they also have the most uh, widespread lateral roots um, compared to the others. But you can also see two things, that um, there is a huge spread within the groups, right? So you can have trees that basically grow 58 meters deep. That's like 150 feet, right? Uh, but then you can have tree trees that actually uh, like have like one foot of, of, of root, rooting depth, right? Um, 
And so, so, so there is a spread within groups. So like even within one form of a plant with a specific lifestyle, you, you, there's actually a tremendous uh, variation that one could explore. Um, and also, ob obviously, trees and shrubs are very long-lived often, and so they have a lot of time to produce root mass. So if your aim would be to produce more root mass, uh, you have to consider the time axis, right? Because if you have like a 300-year oak that had 300 years of forming a root system, you cannot compare it with a, a one-year um, one annual plant. Okay, so, so that's basically the big overview. So, so roots uh, basically come in like lots of different uh, shapes and, and sizes and are different between different uh, plant groups um, with different lifestyles, but there's a huge variation even within these groups. And so um, connecting back to Joe Noel's talk, um, to our ambition to uh, generate negative CO2 emissions, that's what essentially the plant initiative of, uh, is about. We want to take the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and make, put it safely in the soil. Uh, there are two main things. Joe talked about the second point. So we want to basically bring um, carbon in the soil um, that is very stable, that cannot be degraded readily and co cannot be used by microbes and, um, and is not degraded by microbes and, and fungi and, 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 and small animals. So we want to lock the carbon up in, in chemical forms using biochemistry. But, but one large part of this is to generate more and deeper roots, right? The more roots and the deeper roots we have, the more carbon we can actually get into the ground. And if we then lock this carbon in forms, in biochemical forms that cannot be easily degraded, um, that uh, would make a tremendous difference. Okay, so here's the question that my research deals with. Uh, how do we actually get deep roots? So we can go back to genetics. So if you look at uh, like this uh, very nice picture of um, different prairie, um, prairie plants here where people took a lot of effort to dig them out and, and, and draw them, you can actually see that, um, as I mentioned before, that different species can have very different root systems. The difference between different species is a different genome, right? So, so the idea is that um, if we understand which genes and which gene variants make a difference between these different species or maybe even between different strains in one species that make different root deep depth, we can use these variants using breeding or a genetic engineering um, approaches to have plants with massive root systems. And so for this, we use uh, this plant, but now we are looking at the, um, at the root growth, right? So what you see here are uh, five different strains of Arabidopsis. These are basically um, Arabidopsis plants or uh, strains that have been isolated from different locations on Earth, and they are actually different for many, many different uh, of their properties. And, and one of uh, a major difference between these are different root systems. So you, can, you see a time lapse here of plants grown on an agar plate, and you can see that some of these strains grow um, their root very slowly, and others grow the root much faster and, and in a different way. And so we know that within this species of this model plant, Arabidopsis, there exists a lot of variation of root growth. And this is genetically determined because all these plants here um, experience the very same condition, right? They're growing on the same plate, highly controlled, uh, like environmental condition. So um, we can actually use this variation, which we call natural variation, to try to identify the genetic variants that make this difference, right? Um, and, the, and the processes. And the nice thing is that between the genetic difference between these uh, strains of this Arabidopsis species is, is not very large. So there is um, an average 0.5% uh, of the genome different between these plant, uh, plant strains. So that's not much. My, most of it is the same. Okay, so uh, we don't use for, these, for this, we don't use uh, only five strains, but uh, we take, um, can we turn down the light in front? Is there somebody back there? All right, good. So, um, so we basically use the collaborative work of 60 years of Arabidopsis scientists who basically since the, the 1930s uh, 
uh, went out and collected strains from different parts of the Earth. So every red dot here represents a sampling location of an Arabidopsis plant. And people then have collected these seeds and sent to, to basically stock centers. Um, early on, it was like a single lab that basically uh, maintained these populations. And you can see that actually, um, you can see two things. One, uh, that Arabidopsis scientists have been very busy over the last 60 years. And the other one is that Arabidopsis actually grows you know, in very, very different environments. You can see you know, Arabidopsis can grow in, in northern Africa southern Spain up to, you know, northern Scandinavia. And that's a big uh, climatic difference, right? So in terms of temperature and water availability, you know, it extends into Asia. And, and, and this doesn't even include uh, the, like, new Arabidopsis collections that come from anywhere from the Himalaya to the Yangtze River Basin. So, so we have a lot of strains. All these strains have adapted to different environments. Presumably, there are very different soil types everywhere here in different environmental constraints. And so we can use this resource to study natural variation. So the ability to adapt to different climates, which is very important if you think about climate change, but also the, um, you know, the reason for the differences of these phenotypic changes, like diff having different root um, growth properties. So how do we get from all these strains to the genes? So that's something um, where we use uh, like a pretty modern approach uh, using gene, um, that's called genome-wide association mapping. It's also very prominent in, in, for human genetic studies. Um, so it, it's worthwhile to, to try to understand it a little bit. Um, so the idea is you basically measure a lot of different phenotypes. Like in this case, you can just measure the root length of all these different strains, right? So some of them have long roots, some of them have short roots. You quantify this. You take the genome data, so basically the sequence data, and you try to find regions where accession, so, so where strains with long roots have a common, among these long root strains, have, have a common um, um, a base. And, that, uh, and, and at the same time, strains with a short root have a different base at that position. So you try to, to basically find commonalities between between uh, strains that display the same root length um, that is different than to uh, strains that show a different root length, right? And so you can do it all over the genome. So that's the genome of Arabidopsis. Arabidopsis has five chromosomes that are colored here in different colors. And so you, for every position in the genome, for every letter in this genome, you can do this test. Like, do plants with a long root have um, commonalities that are different from plants that have a short root. And so, so if there is basically a clear distinction between short roots and long roots, you basically get a high signal here, like a peak. Um, and, 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 and you know that there is potentially a, a genetic locus um, in this area of this chromosome one that determines this root length difference, right? And so, so that's a very simple procedure, theoretically. There's a lot of statistics in it because it's, it's not really that simple. There are some confounders, but essentially that's the idea. You do correlations many million times for, for these um, connection between the genotype and the phenotype. And that's also done in human. So uh, you can also take, instead of Arabidopsis, you think, can take you know, um, humans that uh, have a certain disease and humans that are not diseased and, and, and do, do the same thing. And human geneticists have done this over and over again. Uh, in the last, in the past decade. Um, and it's one of the few things you can really do um, to, to, to try to uncover the genetic cause of disease. But anyway, in Arabidopsis, we are very lucky we can go beyond um, approaches uh, um, um, in, in human genetics because we can do experiments, right? So we can basically destroy the gene that we think is responsible and see what happens to the poor plant. Uh, while in human genetics, you obviously don't do that. Okay. So, so the key when I started my lab um, seven years ago in Vienna at the Gregor Mendel Institute was actually not um, this, which is kind of the high-tech part, the expensive part, because people like Joe Acker actually did it for us. We could download it. Um, this was the hard part, basically measuring large numbers of phenotypes, uh, because um, we're not talking about, you know, like 10, 20, 50, 
or 100 measurements, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of measurements. And so uh, my students were very critical when I told them, you're going to measure 100,000 roots. <laughs> and, and they said, no. OK, so, so what we did was to find a procedure that basically, uh, um, where basically a computer would do the measurement work. So we grow these roots on, on these vertical agar plates. So in, on each of these plates, uh, there are 24 seedlings, and each of these seedlings has a root. Then we developed a very efficient way to basically take images of all these plates by um, buying a lot of scanners, writing new software, that all these scanners can be operated at the same time through a push of a button. And then we ended up with all these, you know, all these images. And then um, I developed an algorithm that basically takes this image and uh, makes it into data. So basically what you see here is the virtual representation um, of, of, of these seedlings. So, so basically the computer program um, detects what is a plant, what is not a plant, what uh, part of the image is a root, what is not a root, and basically can, uh, basically, uh, can measure the root very accurately through that. And because it's a computer program, it's very fast, we can measure millions of root with it, roots with it without unhappy students. <laughs> All right. OK, so that's kind of the bread and butter. That's what we do in our lab. Uh, we measure uh, for, for many different traits. You, know, you, you can measure root uh, length. You can measure incre increase of root length. That's the root growth rate. You can measure the way the roots grow, whether they grow a little bit more to the side or not. And you can use chemicals and, and, and other things and perturb this root growth. You can also change the growth environment to see which genes are actually important to determine root growth when, you, uh, when there's a lacking nutrient, right? Like in the soil, you often have lacks of nutrients. Roots respond very, very quickly to that. We can all do this on these plates and find the genes. OK, so today I'm going to talk, you, uh, talk to you about one project just to exemplify um, you know, what we can do with that um, in the lab, uh, where we have tried to understand what actually makes um, more like a deeper root system. And so, so if we think about an, an early root system, which is kind of like, uh, like this here, so a seedling germinates, it, it basically there's a primary root that grows down, and then there's some root branching. And over time, you know, this will actually develop into a massive structure depending on the plant species that is highly branched and has a certain topo uh, topology in the soil, right? And that could be like either very shallow if, if the roots would be in this upper area or very deep if there are mo more roots growing downwards, right? And so if we think about the processes that actually are important to make this from this, it's, uh, there's only a limited number of processes that we can think of. One is the growth rate of roots, right? So if, if this primary root will grow a lot, it, like the whole root system might become deeper. Then there's the direction of the, of the roots. So some of these lateral, lateral roots grow actually more to the side, so they are offset from the vector of gravity. So that's very important, right? If, if all roots would not grow downwards, but sidewards, you would have a very different root system. And then there are, there's root branching and then secondary root growth. That's also very important for the root system. The interesting thing is that Many of these processes are dominated or are regulated by one particular hormone, which is the plant hormone auxin. Auxin is kind of the plant hormone that does everything in plants. Um, uh, it, 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 it is involved in, you know, in, in flowering. It is involved in basically every process in plants you can imagine. And it's also a problem because if it's involved in everything, how does it do something specific? But that's a different story. But we knew that actually auxin basically impacts all of these important traits. So we thought, OK, so if we now study the natural variation, so the, the differences of how different um, uh, strains respond to this hormone, we might learn something about, um, about this process, uh, about the root system architecture formation, whether, uh, you know, whether like some strains um, modulate the auxin signaling a little bit to build a different root system. And so, so the key um, essay that we were focusing on this is, is, is one of these processes that is highly auxin regulated, and that is, that is uh, the root growth direction. And the, I think the most impactful demonstration of how well roots regulate genetically their root growth direction is an essay like this that already was conducted back in the days by Charles Darwin. And he got very fascinated by it, and that is basically um, 
the, the ability of, of roots to sense the vector of gravity, and that's done in their root tip, um, and to basically uh, adjust their direction of growth to the vector of gravity. So if we do something mean to the plants and we turn around this plate, um, this happens, the plant somehow senses the change in the orientation of the gravity vector and then um, responds by it by basically elongating the, the cells up here a little bit more than the cells down here. And so the, you get more material in the upper part and this and this and this leads basically to this curvature. Okay, this is highly auxin regulated and this is a very important part, this regulation is a very important part in which directions root grow because different ladder roots, for instance, have a different set point. So, so this very strict adherence to the vector of gravity is mainly observed in primary roots, so the roots that really grow, you know, emerge first and grow downwards or in tap roots. Uh, but then in higher order roots that basically grow a little bit more si sidewards, this basically set point is adjusted a little bit. So if you would turn around, you know, side roots, like higher order side roots like this, they would not turn, you know, down, but they would basically turn down to the side a little bit. And we know that this turning is dependent on auxin. So what we did is we used a drug that uh, perturbed auxin uh, transport. So the action of this hormone auxin is very dependent on its transport uh, and also its ability to regulate, to, to make sure that roots grow in the correct uh, orientation. Um, and so if we block the transport using a drug that's called NPA, so, so you basically um, disrupt the, um, the, the transport um, proteins or the function of the transport proteins, um, you can actually see that in different strains, like each of these pictures, we have like three individuals of a different strain are affected by this very differently. So this strain, for instance, still maintains its growth orientation of the root pretty well, while uh, these roots go completely crazy and they lose their ability to adjust their root growth direction to the vector of gravity quite a bit. So because we have, um, uh, we can do this image processing, we can actually quantify this using a mathematical measure and then basically can quantify the uh, hori horizontalness of the root system. But anyway, so we can map this on the, on, on the genome. So those again are the five chromosomes and you can see here on chromosome five there is one uh, peak that crosses our statistical significance threshold here. So that's basically our threshold where we say we believe in these peaks. We believe in the signals if it's above here. All right. So you can, you can zoom in using the genomics tools that uh, Joe, Joe Ecker described um, earlier. You can actually like really zoom in and know which genes are actually in this region. And if you zoom in, we can see uh, that uh, this signal here is uh, above, like in a gene. So, so the representation of genes is here in these boxes. So uh, we have introns and exons here of the genes um, uh, visualized differently. And we can see that actually this um, region of the genomes where basically um, all the roots that are like um, still growing downwards have the same nucleotide here and the roots that basically grow in all different directions, have another nucleotide here, is actually located in a gene. And if we look where this gene is expressed, and there's again a community resource um, that has established the expression pattern of all the genes in Arabidopsis in all the different cell types of the roots. So, uh, and where you can visualize it, we can actually see that this gene and, and, and the cells where it is expressed, uh, marked here in red, is actually expressed um, in this structure here called the root cap. Um, and then in this zone. Um, this actually um, made us very optimistic that this is the causal gene here because the gravity is actually sensed here in these cells and the auxin that then uh, basically uh, gets transported to tell the other cells in the root that there's something wrong in the orientation of the root growth is transported through these cells here. So, so the expression of this gene was actually in an area that made com complete sense with um, the function of a gene that we would look, at, look for. Okay, so then we did something that we can nicely do in Arabidopsis. We um, did things to the genes, to the gene here. Uh, so this gene that, um, that's just below this peak here and where you saw the expression, uh, expression has the great name, 
Uh, it's very easy to memorize. Exorcist 70A3. Uh, it, is, uh, um, it is part of a, of a very important uh, multi subunit um, uh, complex. But you know, we just call it Exo 70A3. Okay. So, uh, so you can basically do two things uh, with a gene if you want to study its function. You can basically overexpress it, so you make more of it everywhere and see what happens, or you can destroy it. And, and, and um, in order to destroy it, we use this CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing technology that you might have heard about. It's a, it's a relatively new technology that you can use to make precision genetic changes. And we used this to destroy this gene. Okay. And so, so what you see here when we use the, the, these treatment conditions, so blocking oxygen transport by using this drug, NPA, you can see that actually the deviation of the vector of gravity in the, in the, in the knockout, so in the destroyed gene, and the overexpressor more is much larger than in this wild type, which tells us this gene is necessary to control even under those um, well, oxygen perturbed condition the, the growth of the root. You can actually visualize this here statistically, and you can see that under normal conditions where you don't perturb this oxygen transport, uh, there's no difference between all these lines, but when you perturb this, there's a huge difference between the wild type where the gene is functional and um, all the lines where we destroyed or overexpressed this gene, which tells us this gene is truly involved in this process. Okay, I can show you what it actually then does for rear plant because rear plants don't grow um, uh, in environments where there's this NPA drug and where oxygen is, uh, is basically, uh, oxygen transport is perturbed. But uh, when, we basically, when, when we basically challenge the plant by changing the vector of gravity, there is actually a big difference between uh, plants that, um, that have a, like a non-functional uh, version of this gene. So, so this is this, this essay here that I showed you earlier. You can see in the wild type plant where the gene is functional, the root turns down very nicely. And in, the, in, in, in this line where we overexpress this exo 70 a 3 gene, this response is much slower. So basically, this gene is involved in the, in the correct timing of eliciting a growth response when um, you know, the root is not growing down, straight down anymore. And you can visualize that. That's basically, um, this is the uh, Columbia, which is the wild type where the gene works. And this is the overexpression line. And you can see that um, if you plot the angle change, so what we see here, right, this turning of the angle, uh, this turning of the root, basically you can measure the angle of the turning of the root. This is uh, in plants where this gene works. And this is in plants where the gene doesn't work or its function is perturbed. And you can see there's a strong difference uh, in the, uh, in basically in the sensitivity or in the, in the, in the rate at which the, the root basically turns. And you can actually see that in these accessions that we had originally screened with this auxin perturbing drug as well, right, um, that this one group that has one version, one allele of this exo 70 a 3 gene basically is much more like this Columbia wild type here, and the other set of accessions or the other set of strains that basically was more susceptible to NPA turns much, much more like this uh, mutant or this overexpression line. So that tells us this, uh, the variation, the variant of this gene is likely uh, responsible for, for, for the phenotype that we observed. Okay, so um, this is getting into the details of how this might work molecularly. So uh, as I told you, uh, usually if a plant grows down, it, it continues, like if a root grows down, it continues to grow down. And um, basically it is happy if we turn it on the side, uh, it basically starts to turn. And the reason why it turns is actually that this auxin that is um, here visualized in green starts to get asymmetrically localized. So if a, if a root grows downwards, the auxin is in the same concentration at the two sides. If the root is basically turned, oxygen is transported to one side and not the other, and that leads then to the turning. Okay, so this transport process is uh, basically uh, dependent on oxygen transporters. And these transporters need to basically get into, uh, need to be shuttled into the membranes of plants, 
And this shuttling of these transporters into the membranes is dependent on this exorcist complex. And that is one of the subunits that we found. So it's like a super complicated molecular process that is not directly related to auxin transport or auxin biosynthesis, but it's rather related to you know, the way how you put the stuff that transports auxin. So very complicated. But it's, it, uh, like in other cases we have found out that's the way how often natural variation works. It does not you know, mutate um, you know, like the, the obvious things, but rather things a little bit at the side and, and I think one reason of this is if you would, if natural variation or evolution would basically play with like very, very important central components of important processes, um, like, the, like these, uh, it would lead to detrimental com like, uh, consequences, right? So often like natural processes kind of tune processes a little bit. And, and in this case, does too. So, uh, if, you, if you are interested in uh, or how this might act, here's the answer. So there are many different auxin transporters and then we basically can visualize the location of these transporters using uh, fluorescent proteins. And so, so this is again the wild type and this is one, the, the, only, the only one that we found to be affected. And usually this auxin transporter is basically expressed a little bit in this root tip. So you see the green signal here, that's the root tip. But if you overexpress this exo 70A3, actually its expression domain, the number of cells in which this transporter is present is actually expanded. You can see that nicely here. If we mutate, if we destroy this exo 70A3, actually it's gone. So there's no oxygen transporter here anymore. And a very nice thing here is that basically there's another region in which this particular um, oxygen transporter is expressed is in the vasculature. And that's not changed. That's why we know that we can really trust the absence of the signals because usually if you, if you find an absence of something, it's a tricky thing because you don't know whether like, you're just like not uh, having your settings right. But in this case, it, it, it's very, very neat. So we were very happy. So, so basically, no matter if you have too much or you don't have anything or, or, or more, you dysregulate this process of the root growth direction control. Okay. Okay, so that's kind of the model, the complicated model. We went through a lot of work to basically understand how can root systems actually adjust themselves a little bit to um, respond differently to the same hormone, to the same input, to change root growth direction um, um, in, in a certain manner. Okay, so that's, that's interesting. I think that's like for our, like for the root aficionados, that's like super exciting, but you know. <laughs> Like, does it matter? Okay, so, uh, so that's why we went further. I mean, like one thing that we are pretty confident um, by using natural variation. So these different natural strains uh, where we know that the genes that we find have undergo undergone some kind of selection. Uh, we think it must be somehow of relevance because otherwise you would not actually find the same alleles in a lot of strains that do this different, the, that, that, that do a similar thing because otherwise, you know, it would be uh, like random, right? So, so, so we think by using this natural variation, uh, we think we're actually picking up differences that matter. But often these differences are rather subtle, like this offset of the, 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 the change to the root growth through the gravity direction. But you can imagine actually that over time, you, you know, little differences can up, add up significantly, right? So we are looking at a couple of days, but if like a process happens over weeks or years, you, you might um, get a, um, a very significant change. So that's why I told my, my postdoc Takeiko, who did most of these work, okay, we gotta look in the soil. And he wasn't very happy about that, but, but he devised a method uh, that I call pot chopping to basically look at Arabidopsis roots in the soil. There, there are different ways how people look at roots in the soil, some of them are based on rhizotrons. You might have seen that actually. Um, some people I think might use them even like for uh, teaching purposes. It's basically the rhizotrons are uh, roots in a thin layer of soil between two glass uh, windows. But obviously if you do that, you constrain the root growth into two dimensions. So it's not very natural. And, and so, so we thought we, we, we do this like more natural thing. We grow uh, a, a, an Arabidopsis plate in a large pot so that it can expand in all three dimensions. And then we cut it using a very sharp bandsaw 
and then we take a high resolution image and mark all of the root segments. We do this also very important for, for these types of experiments in a blind manner so that the person who marks up these root segments doesn't know what he or she is looking at, right? Because otherwise there is the, the danger of um, a bias, or whatever you expect. Um, but once we did that, actually we found something very encouraging and that was that, all, that the accessions, and those are four accessions that uh, were in this one group that responded um, uh, less to this NPA treatment, actually all had a shallow root architecture and the accessions, uh, the strains that actually had a strong response to our chemical treatment on plates had a deep root architecture. So that ma made us very hopeful. But then, of course, the, the, the thing to test whether this exo 73 is responsible for this difference is you need to look at the mutant or the overexpressor, and that's what we did here. And you can see that actually by overexpressing this one gene in the whole genome, you switch a shallow root architecture to a deep one because there's only one difference between those two plant um, lines, and that is the overexpression of the 73. So we basically, by, by modulating the response to root growth direction a little bit, you can switch a root system significantly um, to a more downwards, more deep configuration. All right. Then there's another question that we can ask, right? How does it actually relate to the environment where these strains, strains come, came from, right? So, so the nice thing is we did this initial studies on uh, with the NPA treatment on, um, on strains that came from all kinds of different places. And so you can actually take all environmental parameters that these strains would encounter in the wild uh, and ask, is there any correlation with the variants, with the alleles of this exo 70 a 3 that we found? And when we did this, uh, we found actually the SNP, uh, the position in the genome, the variant that we had mapped, uh, belonged to, um, to the top um, 5% of all, uh, you know, variants in the genome that are correlated with uh, precipitation seasonality, which is essentially um, a very different rainfall pattern. So if you have a high seasonality, um, it only rains in one season or in a short amount of time. If you have a low seasonality, you are in the tropics and it always rains, like, no matter what kind of season it is, right? So, so then we wanted to test whether, like, these different uh, root system configurations make a different difference in different precipitation um, uh, regimes. And so, so we basically took the same number of uh, the same lines. We grew them under well-watered condition in the growth chamber and under drought conditions, like very mild drought, con drought conditions. Um, and we actually found that um, um, under drought conditions, the, the, the strains that actually had one uh, exo 70 a 3 allele performed much worse than the other one. So that would basically be in support uh, of a model where these changes in root system architecture play a role for drought resistance, for mild drought resistance. So, so I think this, this nicely shows you kind of the extent that we can use these kind of modern uh, methods to, to try to, first of all, figure out which genes uh, with, or, and which uh, natural variants of genes actually lead to um, important changes in, in plant growth, like deep rooting, and that's what I'm mostly interested about. And then you can also ask, like, does it actually has a relevance for, or a potential relevance for the adaptation to very different areas uh, with different uh, climate parameters. Okay, so, so that was just one, one thing. You might have realized that a lot of our essays, uh, initial essays, depend on all these plates, and uh, initially, you know, my students were not very happy, were very happy when we had like all this computational processing of the images, but that's so efficient that then everyone had to make more plates and more essays, right, with their hands. So, so since I moved here, we actually uh, got a robot that actually does the preparation of these essays, which was essentially the bottleneck after our image, uh, you know, after our computational image processing. And so, so right now we actually, um, we can do a lot of more essays and a lot of more um, different essays using Larry the Robot that was funded by um, a crowdfunding campaign. And the major donor was Larry Greenfeld. That's why we named the robot Larry. And so, so right now we can actually go from, um, from, from, uh, from an experimental series, like the one that I um, um, told you about that took like around five weeks. We can do that in a day. So, 
So we can actually look at a lot of more um, parameter combinations. You know, stresses, for instance, or nutrient deficiencies often don't occur alone. And you want to look at the, at the interactions of things, interaction of hormones, interaction of nutrient impacts on roots. And this robot allows us to do that. OK. So um, I hope you uh, kind of remember the beginning of the talk. So, so, so one of the reasons, apart from the joy of uh, basic biology and discovery, which uh, my, I, mean, I mean, which is the reason why I'm in science, is that we can actually do something very useful. And because roots are a prime target for carbon sequestration, this is like basically everything that we find that relates to rooting depth or different root system architectures might have a very, very important um, application. Um, root growth is genetically and environmentally controlled. I didn't tell you so much about the environmental aspect, but it really depends. If you put the same strain in different environments, the root will look different. And, 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 and now, especially with our ability of doing these um, essays in a much higher throughput, we can actually understand the basics for that much better now as well. Um, we can already now discover genes and genetic variants that um, are important for deep rooting. And we can actually then go on because there exists a huge body of knowledge in the Arabidopsis field about pathways and molecular interaction. We can really go down to the molecular details why this is. I showed you this oxygen transporter that actually shows us this is maybe a process that we can target in many different ways to get deep rooting, right? So, so we build, uh, we are basically standing on the shoulders of giants and can basically drill down with this knowledge uh, to do very high, precise root system design at some point, hopefully. And then uh, the deep root traits, obviously, uh, once we figured out many ways to make deep roots, we can go to Joe and he gives us the variants for the different uh, suburban and we just combine them and we'll have our ideal plant root systems actually sooner than later, I hope. Okay, so uh, yeah, so, so maybe just to highlight Takiko Ogura, who did most of the work that I presented uh, today on the deep rooting. Uh, and thanks for your attention.